you may not know that on Labor Day of 2023, this past Monday, there was an epic water balloon fight at the Bollinger backyard. Water balloons were flying everywhere. It was a very dangerous situation. David and Asher had hit me multiple times. There were screams. And Phil, your kind and gentle pastor, fired a high-velocity, close-range water balloon at me. And at that moment, I whipped around to evade this new hazard like a warrior ninja and uh, forgot that our fire ring was right behind me, (laughs) not on fire currently. Um, And I completely crashed into the metal ring with my chin. Uh, In that moment, I might not have been thinking about whatever is noble, whatever is right. (laughs) Uh, And so it it really took out my legs. So if I'm limping around, I've had the, the chance this week to really put my feet up while I worked on this sermon. Um, not related to the sermon itself, but I thought you had to know. (laughs) I'm okay, but if I do some flamingo-type moves, that's probably why. Thank you, Tom. (laughs) So our passage in Philippians um, is such a familiar one. It's It's a beautiful passage. Be honest, Paul can be really difficult for me to understand at times. I'll often read, uh, be reading in one of his letters and think, what on earth is he talking about? His language can be dense and theological. Um, I can read, be reading through and think, I know all the individual words. I think I do anyway, but I do not know what he is saying here. And even Peter says uh, in 2 Peter 3.16 of Paul, his letters contain some, this is a quote, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. (laughs) I appreciate that. I agree. Uh, But Phil had mercy on me with a schedule here, and uh, I think this is a passage of Paul, we can agree probably, that feels very easy to understand and very accessible. It makes direct sense in my current life, living in Pennsylvania in 2023 as a soccer mom. I feel like I can just pull in um, some great applications. I don't feel like I need to do a lot of heavy lifting with the commentaries. Um, I mean, hey, I don't like conflict either. You know, you have these two women, like, stop fighting. Um, I struggle with worry and anxiety. I like joy. I agree that it's a good idea to think about good things. But as I was sitting there reflecting on this passage and how understandable it was, uh, I started to consider what Paul is asking of the people of Philippi. And I started to think, wow, Paul, these are pretty big asks. Here's my nutshell of what Paul is teaching here. And by the way, I'm hoping this will be short, shorter for your sake and mine, but anyway. <laughs> uh, here's the nutshell. Please get along with others and help others to get along with each other. Don't worry about anything. No one has trouble with that, right? Be joyful all the time. And have a pure and noble thought life. I don't know about you, but to be honest, at any given time, I think I might be managing one out of four on these. But one thing to remember when you encounter scripture offering guidance on good life practices is that they often don't focus on behaviors that are already easy to practice, that we have already achieved. Scripture is not for perfect people. It's for broken people like you and me. There's a quote by uh, Rich Mullins, the singer-songwriter, that always makes me laugh. He said at one point, I never understand why going to church made you a hypocrite. 
because nobody goes to church because they're perfect. If you got it all together, you don't need to go. You can go jogging with all the other perfect people on Sunday morning. <laughs> Anybody pass a jogger on the way to church? That's a perfect person. You got to got to appreciate that. And the same could be said about those of us who are reading scripture and trying and failing and trying again to live by these beautiful high standards of God's good way of living. We are not perfect, but we are helped a great deal by regularly being retuned to the right notes, uh, being reoriented to what is, in fact, good for us. And that is what I think is going on with these words of instruction from Paul. Okay, that's a, that's a long introduction. Let's take a little time to look at these sections. So first you have here Paul's request to the two ladies at the church to stop their disagreement. This makes me laugh when I look at it. I think, oh my goodness, he's mentioning them by name. How would you feel if someone mentioned you by name in a public letter to try to stop your behavior? <laughs> what if the LMC, and I wish Amherst was here, sent out an email to all of our sister churches and requested, among other things, that Sarah Bollinger and Amaris Allen please stop arguing over their favorite color of lawn chair, <laughs> that this disagreement was harming their ministry work, and could Herb Keener please intervene to help stop the fighting? <laughs> so initially I was kind of amused and alarmed at Paul's blunt reference to these two women's uh, disagreement. But a number of other pieces stand out to me in this text. Paul pleads with them to come to agreement. He's pleading with them. He asks rather than demands. There's no tone of disgust here. He also asks that someone else help them with the reconciliation process. And he notes how helpful they have been to him as co-workers in his ministry work. He does not dismiss them as squabbling women. They're important, love, a blessing to the church. Paul does not want them to be stuck in bitterness and hurt over a disagreement that was apparently significant enough to come to his attention in prison. Notice that he does not weigh in on the actual point of disagreement. That's interesting. He does not say, you know, Euodia has a point here. Um, he says, work your way through it, and others should help you. Disagreements come up in life, in the church, in our families. In the past few years of COVID and the political climate swirling around it, I don't know many families or friends who have not felt a great deal of disagreement and division. We hurt each other. We act thoughtlessly. We say things uh, we should not. We hold a grudge. We let it simmer. We let our anger or hurt shape our interactions. I believe Paul is reflecting the heart of God wanting his people to seek to reconcile, if possible, to encourage others to be a help in that process, rather than ignoring the situation, just sweeping it under the rug, thinking that's their problem, I'm glad I don't have anything to do with it. I am going to just absolutely confess that I hate conflict. I am not one of those people that kind of gets a thrill out of the argument. I really don't like having a serious disagreement with someone. And if I'm, if I'm around people having a disagreement, my most preferred thing to do in the moment would be to run out the door. I don't know if anybody's with me, but that, that is me. Raising children, though, has given me the opportunity to be at the center of multiple serious disagreements every day. So I'm getting a lot of practice lately. But we all know that it is better when those disagreements are resolved. 
then the poison of unresolved hurt does not fester and harm us and those around us. But sometimes we really need help with this. And sometimes it is not possible to resolve a disagreement that's going on. But we are a people who are called to try. What disagreements are you experiencing right now? Is it your disagreement that's coming to mind or one between others of your family or friends, co-workers? Might there be something you could do, a step toward reconciling or helping? Hey, maybe you feel like you have tried already. Uh, but prayerfully consider if God is pleading with you as Paul pled with these two women. This is very hard stuff, but we don't do it alone. Okay, so on to rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I'm with Tom on this one. Uh, be joyful. Only a few comments here. I agree with Tom. It is my understanding that this is not a command to have a cheerful disposition. Thank goodness. I mean, if those of you who have a cheerful disposition, that's so wonderful. I do not have that. <laughs> if you think I do, I, I'm so delighted. I'm doing a good job hiding <laughs> my crabby disposition. Um. But I think this is an encouragement to remember that the end of the story is good and the storyteller is good. We have a good God, an astoundingly good God. We may have a difficult life. We may have heartache, loneliness going on, bad physical health. You may feel like you are failing in, in different things and um, feel crushing loss, uncertainty and fear about the future. You might just not be having a good time in life right now. But this is not the end of the story. To be joyful, we need the long view that we are loved, treasured by the God of heaven and earth who fights for us and gave the most precious thing he had to make a way home to him for us, for you, for me. As Phil said a few months back, which he did not remember, but I'm pretty sure he did, we are a people of a joyful story. Personally, I can lose my way on this one, but it's important to get back on the path, to remember our deep joy. How are you doing with joy? Do you feel a sense of gladness? Moments of joy that help you through the day? Do you struggle to feel any joy at all? We have a God who wants us to remember our joyful story always. And let it run like a deep river through all of our varying life circumstances. Remember, remember the good things that God has already done for you and all that he promises to do. On to anxiety. When I first looked at this passage, I thought, this is all I'm going to talk about, right? We, we could just talk about this the whole time, and that at least would be good for me. <laughs> so here's, here's this section. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything. This is a tall order, in my opinion. Kind of like, do not breathe the air in this room. <laughs> the first commentary I open on this verse... Uh, I read, no anxiety, exclamation point. There must be no anxiety or worry about anything. I thought, what? Yes, anxiety. Anxiety about all kinds of things. Um, the commentator continued, to care is a virtue, but
but to foster care, which I guess is worrying, uh, for such anxiety is not trust in God, but trusting in oneself, which comes to inward suffering, fears, and worry. Did I skip something there? To foster care is sin, he says. All right, so that's where he lost me. I thought, I can't believe that worry is sin or I am I am without hope. <laughs> Many of us struggle uh, with worry and anxiety about all kinds of things. I bet you could all make a list for me. I mean, there is a lot to worry about. Our families, our finances, our health our work. Uh, The American Psychological Association defines anxiety as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes such as increased blood pressure and heart rate. This sounds kind of like a familiar emotion, um, probably for many of us. And we are immersed in a very anxious culture. Does the news, and the news is just full of happy stories, right? The news makes us very anxious. I've kind of given up on the news. Everyone's got a different take on the news, which news you listen to. There's fake news. There's real news. I don't know where the right news is. But anyway, the news definitely is making us anxious. Um, I think social media, even though it's a lot of fun, also tends to make us anxious because we tend to compare and present ourselves, try to present ourselves in the best light and get anxious about whether you look just the right way uh, in these posts. Advertisements, I think, are definitely designed to make us feel dissatisfied and worried that we need something more so that we buy it. But there's just a lot of real worry out there. We might worry about losing our spouse We might worry about our children and how they're doing in school. Asher just started preschool. I was very worried. Twice we've been told that he's been non-compliant about this or that. You know, he was supposed to have his red, his foot painted red and make a little footprint on a page of paper. These are the things that I get to worry about now. He refused to have that foot painted. And (laughs) as the teacher is reporting on all that happened that, that day, she said one child would not have his foot painted. I just thought Asher. Immediately I thought it was Asher. (laughs) Sure enough, he comes out and he has a handprint instead of a footprint on his paper. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, we we worry about the little things and the big things. Um, We worry about our spiritual lives. They can be assailed with anxiety too. Am I praying enough? No. Am I spending enough time in devotion? Have, have I tried this app? Are you reading your Bible? Which version are you reading? Is it a good reading plan? I just decided a couple of days ago, maybe I'd try to start at the end of the Bible and read backwards. And I have not found a reading plan to support that yet. So if you know of one, <laughs> let me know. Uh, even looking at this text in Philippians can make me anxious because I'm worrying about how I'm failing not to worry. What are your worries? What are the concerns that trouble you? What keeps you up at night? Worry can be crushing. Anxiety can be crippling. We want to escape it, and sometimes we choose the wrong means of escape. I think what Paul is telling the church here is that God is like a wonderful parent who does not want his child to suffer and struggle with worry and anxiety over things that child can't control or feels overwhelmed by. He wants that child to come to him for help. And this is where the peace that passes all understanding, what one scholar translates as mind-blowing peace, is available to us through our kind and caring Father. Here's a prayer from the Psalms that can be of guidance to us. Psalm 55, 1. There's a lot of anxious Psalms, probably about half of them. So you can look there if you need a little (laughs) help for anxious praying. 55, I'm going to read the first two verses and, um, and then two later verses. 
Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught. As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Okay, lastly in this passage, we have a section uh, where Paul talks about where to focus our thoughts. So I'm going to reread this too. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I used to really love scary movies. Any scary movie fans here? Hey, I got a couple. Uh, And horror novels. Growing up, two of my favorite movies were Jaws and Terminator 2. Anybody with me on that? I'm going to be really impressed. (laughs) I just got the biggest kick out of them. Sometimes I look at these verses and wonder, was I messing up here? Uh, Maybe not the noblest. You know, some of you are thinking, yes, obviously you were messing up here. (laughs) This also makes me think of my grandma. She used to say she loved a good, clean murder mystery. A good, clean murder mystery. I think I'm right on that. How many of you enjoy murder mysteries? I'm taking it down a level so it's a little more sane. Yeah? I bring these things up because we can look at this passage and think we should never read or listen or to or think about anything that does not fully fit these beautiful adjectives. And I do think it is worth considering what we like and what we are reading and watching and consuming, listening to. Uh, But I think often what we are drawn to is the goodness in these stories, the pictures of redemption, justice, selfless love, and so on. But if the thoughts being formed by the things you are watching or listening to are not good, if they're destructive, then maybe it's not for you. Worth thinking about. I mean, Jaws is totally good, but... (laughs) here is what Paul is not saying. He does not say whatever is false, whatever is lacking integrity, whatever is wrong, whatever is impure, whatever is despicable, if anything is terrible or worthy of censure, think about such things. What I see here is don't focus over much on all that is wrong in this world. That we can do to, uh, to a fault. Don't focus over much on all that is wrong in your life. Your mind can be like a garbage dump, but it can also be a place of beauty. We should trend towards the latter. Make it a place of beauty. We have a choice here. If you are a glass half empty person, this can be challenging. My dad used to say his glass was not only half empty, it was also laced with cyanide. (laughs) It is tempting to look at changes in our culture, in our nation, in the broad church, and think doomsday. We are in the end times. And hey, maybe we are but there is still a lot of good to think on. Remind yourself of the good things regularly. Pay attention to the beauty around you. Look at the green fields. Look at the harvest that's happening right now. Look at the faces of your family, your friends that you love. Look at their faces. Sometimes we don't do that because we're looking at our phones so much, right? Listen to the laughter of your children. Asher, despite his mild centers, was 
um, described as having uh, a wonderful infectious laugh in his rap sheet, you know. <clears throat> Think of God's past rescue of you and your family. Do not feed yourself a steady diet of how bad things are and how much worse they are going to get. Read stories of hope. Remember that God wins. One of the good things about a good, clean murder mystery is that justice wins the day and the bad guy gets caught. And in Jaws, the shark is defeated. So, to sum up this passage... Paul, I think, here is teaching us many good things about our God. That God wants us to try to resolve our disagreements with others. That he wants us to be a joyful people. That he knows we worry and wants us to seek his help for everything we worry over. And that our thoughts matter to him. That it is helpful and good for us to think on good things. These are, each one, great challenges for many of us. But they also give us a picture of a very good father. What good father would not want these things for his children? Let's pray. Father God, we are uh, moved by this picture of you wanting these things for our lives. And we just pray for your merciful help um, in our disagreements and our anxieties and the difficulty we have in feeling joy at times and in our thought lives. We commit these things to you, Lord, and we are just so thankful to you for all you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.